Hello guys, gals, and non-binary pals. Welcome back to The Trans Atheist with your host, Ariane. Today is about the rise of Christian nationalism, which is a pretty prominent uh, subject throughout the country. I'm kind of paired in with white nationalism, which is a racist ideology. Christian nationalism is more of a theocratic um, ideology. So we'll start with what is Christian nationalism? Well, in a nutshell, it's the belief that Christianity should govern the government of the United States, that our laws, that our society should be, should be based off of Christian dictates. That's where we get things like this abortion decision. Uh, that's where we get opposition to legal, secular marriage between people of the same gender. Um, that's where we get opposition to things like anti-discrimination laws that would protect uh, various groups, but especially the LGBT community. All of this comes based on a header of Christian nationalism. Now, I got a little bit of a laugh when I was looking up trying to kind of find a definition for Christian nationalism. Because I went to a Christian website called Got Answers, uh, which is, uh, it's gotanswers.org, which was really, actually quite funny. Um, and some of the things it said is that Christian nationalism is often employed as a derogatory term. Well, yes, um, only because what's, what's being advocated for is, you know, pretty negative to society. But what's really funny is further on in this article when they're answering what is Christian nationalism and they're actually kind of separating themselves out from Christian nationalism, they even include in there, in practice, this, talking about how Christians are obligated to individually submit to the will of God. It says, in practice, this means advocating for government actions consistent with a Christian worldview. It includes defying government commands to commit sin at the same time a believer's primary mission is not earthly. So while they're talking about Christian nationalism and trying to separate themselves from it and say that it's just a derogatory term, they literally talk about what is at the heart of Christian nationalism which is this idea of advocating for the government to implement a Christian worldview. And the problem is even that's not consistent. If you've seen some of the videos of these independent fundamentalist Baptist churches, you'll see that what they take are Levitical commands to execute gay people and they say that's an example of a Christian worldview. So are we supposed to pretend like it's not dangerous for them to want to implement and advocate for government actions consistent with that Christian worldview? When that Christian worldview includes the execution of LGBT people when it includes their religion having a preferred status, not only preferred status, but the only status, when it includes allowing only people who profess to the Christian faith to serve in public office, when it includes taking away health care from women and those with the ability to get pregnant and claim that you know they are stuck carrying a child to term, regardless of their circumstances, all because of a Christian worldview. So that is exactly what we are talking about. Now you see a lot of this kind of rising up, especially strong, in the 1980s. For some of you who may be a little bit um, younger and may not have lived through the 80s, like, you know, I was born in the 80s. My husband lived through the 80s as well. And we had things like the moral majority, which was kind of like a forerunner to focus on the family and all of that stuff. Um, they were a political arm of conservative evangelical Christianity. 
and they were ran by Jerry Falwell Sr. Now, if that name sounds familiar to some of you who are younger, that may be because it was Jerry Falwell Jr. who endorsed Donald Trump. As a matter of fact, he was one of the early so-called pastors to endorse Trump. Um, but during that time frame, a lot of things were going on. Uh, first and foremost was the panic over the AIDS epidemic. Now, keep in mind, the AIDS epidemic was something to panic about, especially given that a lot of treatments that we currently have that can extend life did not exist during that time period. Uh, and the treatments that did exist during that time period were not wonderfully effective, um, but it was people like the moral majority people and Jerry Falwell who were calling AIDS and HIV a gay disease. They were claiming that it was God's judgment on people for their sins. So the next time they want to tell you that their God is a loving God, you can kind of, you know, forget that one because they literally believed, and many still do, that things like AIDS are is God killing people for loving differently than they do. Um, it had an influence. The president at the time, Ronald Reagan, would not even mention the AIDS epidemic that was killing thousands upon thousands of people because, as a lot of Christians during that time frame, evangelical fundamentalist Christians, thought they weren't concerned with AIDS because, in their view, it was killing all the right people. We saw this kind of rise up and continue to kind of morph and change. Um, you know, we ended up with things like don't ask, don't tell, which, you know, a lot of more progressive people now look at as a horrible decision. It was actually an improvement that got Bill Clinton a lot of pretty harsh criticism during that time frame. See, prior to don't ask, don't tell, they were looking to see if they could find any evidence of gay people in the military, and they would kick you out. Um, dishonorable discharge in many cases. Don't ask, don't tell was Clinton's way of softening that a little bit, and even that minor softening came with a lot of pushback from the right wing in the country. It was basically saying, we're not going to ask you about your sexuality, and if you don't tell us about it, and we don't ask about it, then we're not going to do anything about it. And yes, that was a horrible decision, but it was still an improvement. It was a slow progression from where we previously had been. We saw during the um, Bush, uh, and by this I'm talking about W, the Bush administration, uh, they played on this Christian nationalist ideology when it came time for Bush's re-election. So during that time frame, the Iraq war had gotten increasingly unpopular among a lot of people in the country. Now, I don't know what the actual statistics were. I'm sure there was still a pretty high approval rating um, during that time frame, but it had certainly dropped and gotten less popular. And the people who were running his campaign, like Ken Melman, who actually turned out to be a closeted gay man, were worried that because it was so unpopular, a lot of the Republican base would just stay at home during the re-election, that they wouldn't come out in the big numbers that were needed to get George W. Bush back into office for a second term. So what did they do? Well, they went around to states, and along with politicians in, that st in those states associated with their campaign, they worked to get ballot initiatives on the same ballot as the presidential ballot. And what was that ballot initiative? It was a ban on gay marriage. 
in that in, in those particular states. Um, I'm trying to remember the exact number. It was a decent amount. Um, but what they did was they used that for the evangelicals who were less excited than they previously had been to vote for W. Now it was all about sicking it to the gays. So they use that scare tactic to get them out to vote. And if you're a student of the recent history of our country, what you will find is that A, George W. Bush was in fact reelected to a second and equally unsuccessful term in office. And part two, every single one of those ballot initiatives, those attacks on the marriage rights of gay people, which wasn't even happening at that time. We did not have Obergefell. There was not people, you know, states were already deciding it on a state-by-state -state basis. But what ended up happening is every single one of those ballot initiatives passed and became law. Some of them became laws in the state. Some of them became, became constitutional amendments which is actually even harder to overturn. So that was an aspect of the Christian nationalism. And then we kind of saw it going on during the Obama administration, primarily with the Tea Party movement. But all of that got a major jump in 2016 with one candidate. And that candidate was Donald J. Trump. See, in Donald Trump, the radical right saw something that they had not seen in any other candidate. They saw someone who was totally willing to do their bidding at every turn in exchange for power. And especially the most important thing that they wanted, and that was their hand-selected Supreme Court justices. During that time frame, Obama had already been denied the right as a president to appoint a replacement for Antonin Scalia, who had died while in office. They held that position open for the next president to choose, using that as kind of how we did with the gay marriage ballot initiatives to drive the vote. And it worked. Donald Trump won the presidency. We ended up with four, let's see, Amy Coney, uh, Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, I think that's the three, to add in, which put us in a position where right-wing theocrats now control the highest court in the land, and the most unchecked political branch in the United States. There's no voters for the Supreme Court. There's no term limits for the Supreme Court. This is the most powerful branch of the government, while it's not supposed to be. They're supposed to be co-equal branches, but that's not the actual function. And we're stuck with them for a very long time. That was the reason why so many so-called Christians were more than willing to look past Donald Trump's infidelity, his vulgarity, the fact that he represented absolutely nothing that they claimed to believe, but they were still voting for him, and the main reason was the Supreme Court. Now, they got a lot of other things in the process of that. If you look up, it's called, it, you can look, search in Google a website called the Discrimination Administration. It actually lists out the discriminatory practices, policies, bills, and laws put forth by the Trump administration. And it is a mind-blowing number. On day one of the Trump presidency, all mention of LGBT people was erased 
from the government websites with the White House and a couple others. Day one, we ended up with the HUD department saying that emergency shelters could refuse to allow trans women in. We ended up with the Department of Education no longer investigating or holding school systems accountable who violated the rights of trans students. We ended up with the Justice Department issuing opinions and position papers basically saying that it was the position of the Justice Department that there basically existed a right to discriminate against LGBT people. And we ended up with the formation within the Justice Department of this Committee on Natural Law and Civil Rights, which was basically focused on a so-called Christian's Rights mentality. And while most of that was scrapped immediately following the end of the Trump regime, Unfortunately, there were aspects that are not so easily thrown out. Primarily, those Supreme Court justices that we're dealing with right now. So, in a nutshell, Christian nationalism is the belief that our nation is, was, and should be a Christian nation. That the laws of our country should be based on the Bible, the same book that tells you how to enslave people, the same book that tells women that they're to be quiet and subservient to a man, the same book that says that gay people are to be taken out and stoned, the same book I might also add that they don't really want to enforce fully because it also says that adulterers would be taken out and stoned. And if you look at the list of GOP politicians who are on spouse 2, 3, 4, and 5, you'd find that we would probably have a shortage of rocks right now. Um, but this is the basis of what Christian nationalism is. And while many, like the Got Questions website, and apparently it's got questions, but it doesn't have answers, um, would try to make it like Christian nationalism. is just this derogatory term that doesn't exist, that it's not, you know, what, it said, what it's supposed to be. The fact of the matter is even they openly say that they expect the government's actions to be consistent with a Christian worldview. That is... Christian nationalism. It is bad for women. It is bad for religious minorities. It is bad for people of color. It is most certainly bad for the LG, LGBT community. It is not a system of government that is consistent with the foundational principles of the United States. We are not a Christian nation. We are a nation that just so happens to have Christians and Jews and Muslims and Hindus and atheists and Wiccans and every other faith group imaginable that live within our borders and are American citizens. As a representative democracy, a democratic republic, we need to reflect our communities in our government. And if you look at our government, right now we are dealing with a lot of uh, taxation without representation, for lack of a better term. You know, you don't see many atheists in public office because we can't win elections because the right wing Christians attack anyone who's a non believer. You don't see enough LGBT people and people of color not to represent the population. When you look at the population of women and the population of people of color, and then you look at the Congress 
and at the Senate. Those numbers are greatly off because we certainly don't see nearly half of our senators and our congressmen being women or people of color. So Christian nationalism is on a slow climb and it's gotten a major kick under the Trump years. And unfortunately, right now, the solution to the problem of Christian nationalism is not an easy one. We don't really know how to fix it at this point. Um, expanding the Supreme Court is one option that could help. Um, but there are a lot of really bad options. What option, um, the worst option is doing nothing. Educating ourselves and knowing that when you see this Christian nationalism ideology, which is the idea that the government should be consistent with their Christian worldview, understand that they are talking about, they are saying that you should not be an equal citizen in our society if you should be allowed to live in this society at all. Take that very seriously and make sure that you are keeping that in mind when you vote. And that is pretty much it for today's little podcast. If you have any ideas for future podcasts, which I have quite a few written down that we'll be covering, but if you have an idea, something that you want to hear about, something that you want to talk about, please, by all means, leave a comment, reach out, and let me know. Aside from that, that will be the end of today's The Trans Atheist. I am your host, Ariane. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.